Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are today's top stories. Former President Trump in court for his classified documents case. What's happening next with this case? President Biden campaigns across the Midwest after securing the Democratic nomination for the 2024 presidential race. How he's hoping to win voters with billions of dollars in new infrastructure investments. A group of U.S. investors may buy TikTok. With the app's fate in the Senate uncertain, why former Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin is gathering investors. American dancers and musicians targeted with hate propaganda from the Chinese Communist Party by none other than a Chinese-speaking U.S. customs officer. A lawmaker now calling for a thorough investigation. How bad is inflation in the U.S.? Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen now admits she regrets saying that inflation is just transitory. The political crisis in Haiti continues. Why plans to install new leadership are hitting roadblocks, how the U.S. reacts, and what Haitians themselves are saying. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephanie Cox and Chris Beers. A TikTok buyout is in the works. Former U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin told CNBC Today that he's gathering investors to try to buy the app. Just yesterday, the House of Representatives passed a bill to address the threat posed by the short-term short video platform. The legislation would give Chinese owner ByteDance six months to divest from the U.S. branch of or face a ban. TikTok is calling the bill a ban and urging senators to listen to their constituents before taking any action. Mnuchin told CNBC's Squawk Box on Thursday, quote, I think the legislation should pass and I think it should be sold. The former Treasury Secretary added it's great business and it's worth a lot of money. And former President Trump is in a federal courthouse in Florida for a hearing on his classified documents case. His attorneys are asking the judge to dismiss the case. U.S. District Judge Eileen Cannon is hearing arguments on two motions to dismiss. One motion argues that the charges should be dropped due to unconstitutional vagueness. The other argues the entire superseding indictment should be thrown out due to the Presidential Records Act. Several of the arguments today turn on the interpretation of the word unauthorized. Prosecutors argue that Trump had unauthorized possession of classified documents under the Espionage Act. Trump's attorneys argue that under the Presidential Records Act, he was able to designate all the documents as personal. NTD's Arlene Richards is on the ground and will update us on the trial later today. And President Biden is campaigning for votes across the Midwest, promising to invest in local communities and taking aim at former President Trump. Biden was in the swing state of Wisconsin yesterday after securing the Democratic nomination for president. President Biden announced infrastructure investments in Milwaukee on Wednesday for major highways and roads. I'm here to announce the first of its kind investment, $3.3 billion, $3 billion in 132 projects in 42 states. He claimed his rival's campaign threatens the very idea of America. He also accused Trump of wanting to make cuts to Social Security and Medicare and spoke about what he would do differently. Instead of cutting Social Security and Medicare to give tax breaks to the super wealthy, I'm going to protect and strengthen Social Security and Medicare to make the wealthy begin to pay their fair share. Biden won Wisconsin by less than 1% of the vote in 2020. The state is part of the so-called Blue Wall, along with Michigan and Pennsylvania. These are states that were historic Democratic strongholds. Trump flipped all three states in 2016. Biden won them back in 2020, but they have remained battleground states ever since. But Biden's biggest issues continue to plague his campaign. About 100 protesters waving Palestinian flags rallied close to Biden's campaign headquarters in Milwaukee. The protesters marched through the streets earlier to protest Biden's response to Israel's war in Gaza. Biden plans to move on to Michigan on Thursday. It's part of a month-long I'm on board blitz aimed at rallying supporters in seven swing states that could decide the 2024 election. The Republican National Committee shaken up. Former President Donald Trump's daughter-in-law is the new co-chair after former chairwoman Ronna McDaniel stepped down on March 8th. Laura Trump and new chairman Michael Watley, who headed North Carolina's GOP, took the helm on March 11th. 
Now there's talk of a big shakeup in the organization. The Epic Times newspaper had an exclusive interview with Laura Trump on March 12th. Joining us now to discuss that interview is political reporter for the Epic Times, Lawrence Wilson. Lawrence, what did we learn from this conversation with the new co-chair of the RNC? Well, we learned that the rumors of a big shakeup at the RNC are well-founded. There is, in fact, a reshuffling going on, although uh, Ms. Trump would not confirm what the numbers are. That's how many people are being let go. She said some of them are going to be asked to reapply for the position, so it may shake out at a lower number than what's been previously reported in other uh, outlets. But the move is to try to realign the entire organization with the new leadership's focus, which is just squarely on winning races in November. That's the big push, and they want everybody to be on board with that. And what do they think, from what you're learning, uh, will help them win that? Well, there are a couple of things. One that they that Laura Trump spoke about to our reporter is that uh, they want to stop spending money on races that are not competitive one way or the other. It, for example, in some races last uh, cycle, uh, a lot of money was given to candidates who were virtually assured to win. So uh, they're going to stop that practice and focus on the places where they can flip seats, for example, uh, or make a, a, a race more competitive. The second thing that they're going to focus quite a bit on is getting out the early vote. They call it banking your vote uh, or uh, ballot harvesting in places where that's legal. And that's the practice of collecting uh, absentee ballots or mail-in ballots for people who are either too busy or unable to get to the polls. That's controversial practice and it's not legal in every state. Yeah, and talk, talk a bit more about that. The Republican Party has criticized the Democratic Party for pushing um, that sort of tactic, and now they're talking about using the same tactic. Well, the idea in the past was that this is just uh, uh, an opportunity that's just ripe for election fraud. Think about it. If you can go around to people maybe in uh, your union or in your club or uh, in an apartment complex and just collect hundreds and hundreds of ballots, uh, that's been seen as an opportunity to uh, tamper with the election. However, uh, Republicans are now saying, look, we've been playing catch up to the Democrats. They've been doing this for years. We've ignored it because we were ethically opposed to it. But it is legal in some jurisdictions. And where it is, we're going to do it. So there's going to be a big push on that in places, in states where it's legal to do. And that varies a lot from state to state as to how you can go about that. All right. And Matthew Wilson, a political science professor at uh, Southern Methodist University, says... This change in leadership signals a complete integration between the RNC and the Trump campaign. Talk, talk about what he's saying here. Well, what he's saying, <clears throat> his viewpoint is that, in effect, there, there just isn't any difference between the National Republican Party and the campaign to reelect Donald Trump. That's his viewpoint. Certainly, there is a much stronger integration between uh, Donald Trump himself and the Trump campaign and the national party leadership. After all, his own daughter-in-law was just elected co-chair and one of his staunch supporters, a longtime supporter, Michael Watley of uh, North Carolina, was elected chair. But, <clears throat> excuse me, Laura Trump told us that they're not just focused on Donald Trump. Certainly, they want him back in the White House in the November, or reelected in November, but they're looking at down ballot races too. They want to strengthen the Republican majority in the House and flip the Senate. So, this is not a one man show in terms of what they're focused on, but certainly. Uh, the former president now has uh, very strong control over the party leadership. And talk about the debate surrounding whether or not the RNC should foot the bill for Donald Trump's legal fees. 
Yeah, that's been floated as an idea. And uh, Henry Barber, a Republican National Committee member from Mississippi, attempted to introduce a motion that would block that. Uh, that didn't get enough sponsors to be considered in the RNC's meeting last week, so it wasn't even debated. But on the one hand is the idea that, well, this is an impediment to President Trump running an effective campaign because this big money drain of all these lawsuits that he's facing, which, uh, of course, Republicans say are simply politically motivated. On the other side is, well, <laughs> that's, that's not why people give money to a political party is to pay legal fees for candidates. So that's the divide. Uh, most committee members that we spoke with didn't really want to comment on it, but one told me, look, we have committee leaders to make these decisions and we want to do whatever it takes to win. Okay, political reporter for the Epic Times, Lauren, Lawrence Wilson, thank you so much. My pleasure. Next up, the Republican National Committee is suing Michigan's Secretary of State in an effort to trim the state's voter rolls. The lawsuit filed yesterday it claims that Michigan is failing to maintain accurate rolls. The lawsuit claims that at least 53 counties in Michigan have more active registered voters than they have citizens over the age of 18. Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson hit back. She told NBC News that officials have done more in the last five years than in the previous two decades to remove deceased voters and ineligible citizens from the rolls. She called the lawsuit a PR campaign and accused the RNC of abusing the legal process. Former North Carolina Governor Pat McCrory is stepping down from his role as the national co-chair of a group called No Labels. This happened shortly after members of the third party presidential movement decided to continue with their plan for a presidential ticket. No Labels hasn't announced a presidential ticket yet, but an official with the movement says they want to find candidates as soon as possible. No Labels believes many voters might consider voting for an independent candidate. This because they're not happy with potential rematch between President Biden and former President Trump. But some groups criticize No Labels, thinking they could spoil the 2024 election by splitting votes. The group says this argument is meant to scare people and limit their choices. Up ahead, expert testimony on the U.S. strategy in the Pacific Islands region. What are the threats and is the U.S. responding effectively? And Asian Americans are now the fastest growing group of eligible voters in the United States. And candidates are taking notice. Find out more in just a moment here on NTD News Today. Did you know the government can essentially rob you in plain sight? Former Fed Chair Alan Greenspan warned, deficit spending is simply a scheme for the confiscation of wealth. But he added, gold stands in the way of this insidious process. Birch Gold Group has helped thousands of Americans diversify their IRA or 401k into gold. To get a free info kit from Birch Gold, text PREPARE to 989898. Again, text PREPARE to 989898 right now. I started having lumbar pain and the pain was terrific. Called the number. She was asking me very thorough questions and it was like a done deal. You have a pain on the back and the pain on the back goes towards your hip and then goes to the side of the leg, side of the calf, and the foot. And the foot is numb. And he pointed, he says, if we don't correct this now, you will be in pain the rest of your life. Carol was wheeled across the parking lot to the on-campus imaging center for updated MRIs. Immediately after that, left that building, got back over here, he was in there and had the results of that on the screen. We're going to go explain this, 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 and this. That is going to get you almost brand new, okay? All right. <laughs> Back to my active self. Yeah. No pain. No pain. No. no pain here. No. No pain here. No. No pain on the foot. No. No pain on the side. No. No pain on the side. No. No pain on the foot. No. When I came out of that, they said my whole 
face, everything was different. I am a new person. <laughs> oh, a new person, Dr. Bonatti. Oh, and you told me I would be. I said, I'm not in pain. I'm in awe and I'm going home restored. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. For more stories like these and the rest of our program, check out American Medicine Today, featuring cutting edge medical and science innovators and a medical professional's insight on political and social issues plaguing our nation and healthcare. American Medicine Today, Saturday six and Sundays at nine on NTD television and other streaming platforms. Freedom is not free and neither is the truth. In order to bring you the facts, our reporters are out there on the front lines getting the true story. Some of them served 10 years of prison in China. We've been censored on social media. Our Hong Kong printing offices were set on fire and we've been repeatedly attacked by the Chinese Communist Party. But no matter what, we believe that you deserve the truth and so we continue to bring the truth to light. Head on over to getepic.com and try honor journalism that is based in truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. Join us on NTD Good Morning because we want you to stay informed. Kickstart your morning with the latest you missed overnight. Right, and don't forget that inspiration. Absolutely, so let's shine some light on the good news too. Tune in every weekday morning to NTD News. Let's tune into a Senate hearing live now. Senators are discussing U.S. strategy in the Pacific Islands region. China is taking steps to influence the key region, and more countries there are choosing to align with the Chinese regime over Taiwan. Let's watch. Uh, this hearing of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, will come to order. For thousands of years, Pacific Islanders have been masters of the sea, navigating oceans by canoe, guided only by the stars. With climate change and globalization hitting their shores, they've become innovators on how to save their heritage. There are over a million and a half Americans of Pacific Island ancestry and over 1,000 citizens from freely associated states serving in the United States Armed Forces. This puts people-to-people -people ties at the heart of our relationship to a part of the world that has been vital to the strategic interests of the United States. During World War II, the U.S. Navy built an airstrip on what is now the nation of Kiribati. But today, it is the People's Republic of China that has planned to rebuild the former American airstrip. Beijing is signaling, is signing uh, policing deals to provide cybersecurity and community policing assistance in the region. Since the Solomon Islands changed their recognition from Taiwan to China, PRC nationals have moved to the islands flooding the market with low-cost goods, extracting timber and fish and other resources, bringing in tourism practices that threaten the natural environment, in some cases setting up transnational criminal operations that evade the limited capacity of local law enforcement. All this compounds the forces that drive young people to search for economic opportunities elsewhere. Developments that are deeply concerning to the United States and our allies in the region, like Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. At the same time, Pacific Island nations are on the front lines of the climate crisis. Many are only a few feet above sea level. This makes them particularly vulnerable to extreme weather events brought on by climate change. Not only does this mean many of these nations could be uninhabitable in coming decades, it presents a serious threats to important sensitive American military installations. Earlier this year, a series of extreme waves damaged a U.S. military base at the Marshall Islands. A base used as space and missile test range for the United States, Department of Defense, with some of the Army's most sophisticated tracking equipment. So I'm pleased that the Biden administration has prioritized our engagement in the region. Building, on, building new embassies is not easy. We all know that, especially where land and domestic capacity is limited and ocean levels are rising. But I want to encourage the department to be creative and to move as quickly as possible. Beijing will not slow down its efforts to gain influence in, in this important region, neither should we. Congress recently passed and funded for all three compact of free associations nations, and we're glad that the COFA was finally enacted. For more than 40 years, COFA agreements have governed these critical relationships. The Biden administration has called these COFA the bedrock of U.S. role in the Pacific. 
I want to thank Senator Manchin, Brasso, and Ranking Member Risch for their bipartisan leadership in getting COFA agreements across the finish line and signed by the President. I also want to acknowledge the leadership of uh, Senator Schatz and Senator Arona in regards uh, to that agreement. I wish the same spirit of cooperation applied to our China bill and the administration's out-compete China's proposal, which has been proposed again in this year's budget. The U.S. competition with China concerns almost every single member of our committee, as well as most members of the United States Senate. I appreciate the staff on both sides getting us about 80 percent there. Uh, we now need to reach the finish line. But if we're serious about countering China, I ask that the ranking member to work with me and every member of this committee to finish the job in the next work period. I also want to thank our witnesses for appearing before us today. We have a distinguished panel of witnesses, and I uh, look forward to your, your uh, presentations. I hope you will speak about how we can speed up the expansion of our diplomatic presence. How do we work with Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, and others to support and foster uh, economic opportunities in the Pacific Islands? what we can do to climate-proof our military installations to defend our national security interests in the years to come, recognizing the great risks there. And finally, I ask that you lay out what is at stake for the United States military in the region if we fail to engage. I look forward to your testimony. With that, let me turn to the distinguished ranking member, Senator Risch. We've had a long history of friendship with the Pacific Islands, and this hearing comes as we usher in the next chapter of U.S. commitment to the region. Just last week, Congress acted to renew the Compacts of Free Association, uh, as you noted, Mr. Chairman. These agreements are foremost a promise uh, to the three compact countries, Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, and Papua. Uh, through these compacts, we partner with them to advance economic prosperity, provide for U.S. military uh, uh, veterans from, uh, from nations, from these nations, provide cooperation in areas of law enforcement and judicial training, and much more. Further, our security partnership with these states are critical. In World War II, we fought our way across the Pacific, costing significant American blood and treasure. We have been uh, there, we've been in that region for decades, and with these agreements, we stay for years to come. Uh, they are strategic investment in our national defense and in our partners in the Indo-Pacific region. However, in order to maximize these partnership, uh, partnerships, the administration must adjust its policies to demonstrate U.S. focus and commitment are not going anywhere. First, our diplomatic presence in this region still needs serious work. We have been too slow to get our diplomats permanently on the ground to push back against Chinese influence. I'm also concerned about the lack of support for the diplomats we do have in the Pacific. Nowhere is this more evident than the Solomon Islands. By the time the State Department started paying attention, China was already signing a major security agreement. When the department asked for uh, personnel for the post, it did not ask for a single public affairs officer to push back against the Chinese propaganda. Uh, this is a large globe. There's a lot of countries, but uh, my staff has been monitoring uh, this particular region for the uh, numerous important uh, reasons I just mentioned. This isn't just about getting our people on the ground. Once there, they must be able to do their job and advance U.S. interests. It's clear we are moving at the speed of bureaucracy and not the speed of relevance. I have sent five letters to Secretary Blinken urging a nuanced uh, ex expeditionary approach to our diplomatic expansion. I have encouraged using flexibilities uh, that my Secure Embassies Construction and Counterterrorism Act provides to stand up our diplomatic presence and creating a South Pacific management platform to improve support uh, to these remote missions. The Solomon Islands uh, example brings me to a second issue, security cooperation. In addition to greater Chinese military and law enforcement presence in the Solomon Islands, other nations continue to explore security arrangements with China. Luckily, in uh, May uh, 2022, uh, Pacific Island countries came together and rejected China's push for a region-wide security agreement. That was proof of what dedication to sovereignty and regional uh, unity can achieve. Uh, Papua New Guinea, which just signed a new security pact with us last year, has been approached by China about a new security and policing arrangements. Chinese police are present in Kiribati, and we know Chinese has set its sights on other nations. I would like the Departments of State and Defense here today to discuss the implementation of our security pact with Papua New Guinea and help the committee understand how this agreement serves our interests 
region-wide. I would also like an update on where Chinese security cooperation in initiatives are causing the greatest concern and how we are working with our partners to address it. I would especially like the Defense Department to discuss Australia's role in security for the Pacific Islands. Uh, we all know about AUKUS, but there's uh, certainly more to it than that. Finally, I'd like to, uh, an update on economic development in this region. I am aware of our work on undersea cables and illegal fishing, but want to know what other concrete projects we are pursuing. I want uh, real details on this, not just descriptions about creating an enabling environment or building stakeholder networks, et cetera, et cetera. We know that some Chinese projects, like a hospital in Fiji, did backfire. But this means the U.S. and our partners need to get our act together more quickly. With that, I'll turn it back to the Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary. Mr. Chairman, good morning. Uh, Chairman Cardin, uh, Ranking Member Risch, members of this, of this committee, thank you very much for convening this hearing and for the opportunity to testify on U.S. strategy in this strategically important Pacific Islands region. Uh, I'm honored to be joined by my colleagues from the Department of Defense and USAID today. And I understand my good friend, the Pacific Island Forum Secretary General Henry Puna uh, is here as well and honored by his presence uh, as well. Uh, the United States is a Pacific nation and we share longstanding historic and cultural ties with our Pacific Island neighbors. As Vice President Harris said in 2022, the history and future of the Pacific Islands in the United States are inextricably linked. U.S. prosperity and security depend on the Pacific region remaining free and open, prosperous, secure, and resilient. The Pacific Islands are important partners on many global issues, from standing together at the UN on human rights and opposing Russia's illegal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, to contributing to global security through peacekeeping operations and to tackling the climate crisis, as well as combating illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. The Pacific Islands face significant challenges to their security, and their prosperity, including from climate change and economic shocks, making the region more vulnerable to influence from the PRC. As Secretary Blinken has said, the PRC is the only country with both the intent to reshape the international order and increasingly the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to do it. That certainly holds true in the Pacific. Through foreign assistance, elite capture, and robust public messaging campaigns, the PRC has moved aggressively to assert itself in the Pacific Islands. In addition, in recent years, three Pacific Island countries have switched diplomatic ties from Taiwan to the PRC. And in 2022, as uh, the chairman and ranking member noted, the Solomon Islands signed an unprecedented security agreement with the PRC, the details of which have not been publicly released. Of course, as we have often said, we are not in the business of forcing countries to choose, neither in the Pacific nor anywhere else. But we do want to ensure that countries in the Pacific have a choice and the ability to make their own sovereign decisions free from coercion. Under the administration's Indo-Pacific strategy and Pacific partnership strategy, the United States has expanded its diplomatic and development engagement with the Pacific Islands. A U.S. Customs officer targeting an American performing arts company with Chinese propaganda. The incident now leading to calls for a thorough investigation of possible infiltration into the U.S. government. NTD's Iris Tao has more from Chicago. Two days ago at the O'Hare International Airport, performers of the U.S.-based Shengyun Performing Arts were coming back from a successful performance tour in Europe. But when they were going through the customs, an officer with a Chinese accent targeted the performers with the same hate propaganda that a Chinese Communist Party would use to target religious believers. It just sounded like he was trying to put words into my mouth, like, are you being sponsored by Falun Gong? And it just, so I just said, I don't think I have to answer that question because we escaped from China. But this feels like as if we were being talked to by Chinese government. This is the U.S., like, I'm coming home. And this is something that should never happen in the U.S. Many of Shenyun performers practice Falun Gong, a spiritual discipline severely persecuted in communist China. And the officer allegedly also told other officers that Shenyun dancers were illegal because of their faith. That questioning came despite all of the performers holding either U.S. citizenship or legal visas. 
In a statement, a CBP spokesperson says CBP strictly prohibits profiling on the basis of race or religion and that CBP does not tolerate actions that are inconsistent with our core values. And Congressman Ryan Babin, meanwhile, calling for a thorough investigation, saying in a statement that we should never allow the PRC, one of the most repressive countries on the planet, to have influence over our federal government. An immigration lawyer told NTD that a U.S. government needs to strengthen background checks of its officers. Because you can imagine lots of examples where the government of China would would do well for itself to plant people within the U.S. government, asylum officers, USCIS officers, uh, any position within the government. The Falun Gong is one group that certainly has been targeted over the years within the United States, and, and it's important for the U.S. government to be aware about that and to try to uh, actively prevent such uh, threats. Just last year, the FBI arrested two suspected Chinese agents and charged them with attempting to bribe a public official in the scheme targeting Falun Gong in the United States. Reporting in Chicago, Illinois, Aris Tao, NTD News. At a film screening at Harvard, shining a spotlight on a brutal crime happening in today's China. Called State Organs, the award-winning documentary zooms in on China's forced organ harvesting the practice of harvesting organs from victims while they're still alive. Here's a clip of the trailer. The screening was held by three student organizations at Harvard. One attendee said more people need to watch the film because it touches on the issue of humanity. I think this really has to be stopped. It's a genocide. This is not just a, a, a one single occasion. Maybe the film showed a specific families that been persecuted but it's the personal story that tells about a, a larger population the film's producer cindy song said learning about the victims and their stories kept her up at night and drove her to kickstart the project it's like a haunting scar on humanity's conscience we can we must let their suffering their voice be heard by this world she said despite the family's suffering, there's still hope for the future. The film is available in select theaters across the U.S. or to stream online at GenjingWorld.com. With the 2024 U.S. presidential race well underway, candidates are looking to capture the Asian American vote. The demographic is the fastest growing group of eligible voters in the United States, according to Pew Research Center. We have that report. As the 2024 presidential election inches closer, Asian Americans are emphasizing the importance of their vote. The demographic is the fastest growing group of eligible voters in the country, according to Pew Research Center. In the past four years, the number of eligible Asian American voters grew by 15 percent, or roughly two million voters. And political parties and candidates are taking notice. When campaigns are looking for additional votes because, you know, elections are being won by thin margins, they really need to look at the Asian American electorate. Christine Chen is the co-founder of nonpartisan organization Asian and Pacific Islander American Vote. She says in 2020, over 21 percent of the Asian American electorate were first timers. But courting their vote is not a monolithic feat, as the demographic is very diverse. Typically, Indians and Japanese Americans are biggest supporters of Democrats, and Vietnamese Americans are actually uh, large supporters of Republicans. Now, Chinese Americans, they have shifted from being Democrat to now the lar their largest um, um, identification is independent. Republican Congresswoman Michelle Steele represents California's 45th congressional district. Steele says her district is home to the largest Vietnamese American population in the country, along with a significant Korean, Chinese and Filipino American population. In order to win each community's vote, she immerses herself in their culture. For Vietnamese Americans, I have five out eyes and you wear their outfit. You're going to Filipino community, I wear sari, and that's the way you reach out. And it's very important that you use or make elected officials participate in, on these groups. In terms of where some Asian American voters currently stand ahead of the rematch between President Joe Biden and Donald Trump, 
I think every vote counts, and I think that Asians are often underrepresented because they don't get out to vote, because they don't feel like they can make a difference. But I think this year, every vote counts. I'm nervous about it because I don't know if there's any good candidates right now. Up next, how bad is inflation in the U.S.? Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen now admits she regrets saying in 2021 that inflation is just transitory. And car insurance rates just saw the highest annual jump in nearly 50 years. What's behind the rapid increase? Don Ma joins us with the details soon when we return. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. Heavenly Father, I pray to you today to guide us tomorrow. Give us strength as we face death. Help us not to be afraid, as we know that we are going to be coming to your people. One in five children worldwide are faced with the reality of living without food. No family dinners, no special treats, not enough energy to play. All around the world, hunger is affecting children's physical and mental health. Toddlers are suffering from acute malnutrition, which stunts their growth. Kids are forced to drop out of school so they can help support their families. Conflict, inflation, and climate have ignited the worst famine in our lifetime. And we are fed up. Fed up that hunger devours dreams. Fed up that hunger destroys joy. Fed up with the fact that hunger eats childhood. Help us feed the futures of children all over the world by visiting getfedupnow.org. For as little as $10 a month, you can join Save the Children as we support children and families in desperate need of our help. Now is the time to get fed up and give back. When you join the cause, your $10 monthly donation can help communities in need of life-saving treatments and nutrients, prevent children from dropping out of school, support our work with communities and governments to help children go from short-term surviving to long-term thriving. And now, thanks to special government grants, every dollar you give can multiply up to 10 times the impact. That means more food, water, medicine, and help for kids around the world. You'll also receive a free tote bag to share your support for children in need. Having your childhood eaten away by hunger is unimaginable. Get fed up. Call us now or visit getfedupnow.org. The political crisis in Haiti continues, even as the country is in a second day of uneasy calm after Prime Minister Ariel Henry resigned. Politicians across Haiti are scrambling for power after he announced Tuesday he would hand over the reign to a transitional council. Haitian ex-Senator Jean-Charles Moise held a news conference on Wednesday to announce his rejection of the international community's proposed presidential council. Instead, he proposed an alternative council created with a former rebel leader and a Haitian judge. He said the creation of this council wasn't up for negotiation. Former rebel leader Guy Philippe, a Moise ally, said Haitians will decide who will govern Haiti. Philippe was recently released from a United States prison after pleading guilty to money laundering. Other prominent Haitian politicians also rejected the proposed transitional council, which was agreed upon by the Caribbean trade bloc and the United States on Tuesday. Among them, a former army colonel whose party would serve on the transitional council. In a statement, he said he prefers that a judge from Haiti's Supreme Court assume the reins of power. There were small protests on the street of the capital, Port-au-Prince, 
in which demonstrators held placards lambasting the Caribbean community or CARICOM. We want to tell the CARICOM that they cannot choose for us. It's the Haitian people who fought in the streets and who revoked Prime Minister Ariel Henry. We are the ones to install someone at the National Palace. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who was part of the decision-making process to try and resolve the ongoing crisis, so the political transition in Haiti is moving forward. In a press conference, Blinken said he hoped Haiti would soon be in a place where an international security mission can go forward. I was on the phone this morning with President Ruto of Kenya, who confirmed Kenya's um, preparedness to lead that, uh, that mission. Um, as soon as the, this new council is stood up, which we believe will happen in the next couple of days. Meanwhile, the Haitian community in New York welcomed Henri's decision to step down but were skeptical about international intervention in Haiti. Please give Haiti a chance to choose their own, his own destination, because we want to go in forward. You will hear that the international community will say, well, they prepare this time to let emerge a Haitian-led solution. But that's in, 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 in words, uh, because whenever a true Haitian-led solution is, is presented, they do whatever they want to, to sabotage it. The long-delayed mission is intended to boost outgun local police and restore order in Haiti, the Western Hemisphere's poorest nation. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen now says she regrets claims she made in 2021 that inflation is just transitory. This, as new numbers show, inflation is higher than expected. Here's Yellen's response to a Fox News anchor yesterday. I regret saying it was transitory. Um, it has come down, but I think transitory means uh, a few weeks or months to most, most people. Yellen made the statement a day after the latest inflation data came in higher than expected. The consumer price index was at 3.2 percent in February. That's above consensus estimates and up from 3.1 percent in January. The latest data bring the cumulative inflation since President Biden took office to roughly 19 percent. It's not the first time Yellen expressed regret for calling inflation transitory. She made similar statements in January. And joining us now to is NTD business host Don Ma to give us the latest updates from the tech and business world. Don, welcome. What do you have for us today? Okay, so I wanted to talk to you guys about car insurance costs. And the reason for that is because costs are surging and they're surging a lot. So here are the numbers for you. Uh, up almost 21% for the 12 months ending in February. Uh, and for some context, this is the biggest increase we've seen in nearly half a century. So the last time that car insurance rates rose that much on an annual basis was all the way back 1976. So um, that's quite a lot, but not all states are seeing the rise as bad. Uh, there's a lot of variation from state to state regarding the car insurance rate increases that uh, drivers are facing. Uh, so this is partial because auto insurers price their plans based on the losses they're incurring uh, on a state by state basis. So Nevada drivers saw the biggest jump, uh, over 38 uh, percent. Meanwhile, drivers in North Carolina saw the smallest jump uh, in car insurance rates up just 5.5 percent. Such a huge contrast between states. Yeah, that's an interesting point. But also the fact that this is going up is pretty unfortunate considering all the other costs that are going up at the same time. What is driving this increase, Don? Yeah, that's a very important question. And I think uh, it's not just one factor that's contributing to all the rise. Uh, it's definitely a mixture of different elements uh, put together, which is causing the, uh, the rates to increase. So I'll mention one of them. And one of the reasons is a more severe and frequent car accidents. So the number of traffic deaths in the U.S. was up by around 7,000 in 2022 compared to before the pandemic. And this is according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's latest estimates. And this has led to an increase in claims uh, that is well above historical averages because of the severity. Now, according to LexisNexis Risk Solutions data insurers, um, 
they booked losses on 27% of collision claims in 22. So this is insurers. Uh, that's three percentage points higher than 2021. And this data firm also attributes the rise to riskier driving behaviors. You know, uh, the typical things like speeding, for example, or some people maybe texting while they're driving. And of course, we can't leave out the possibility that some may be under the influence, whether it's alcohol or something else. All right, Don Ma, thank you. Thank you. And culture wars are raging in Oklahoma schools. The superintendent, Ryan Walters, is taking heat from teachers unions and LGBTQ activists there. He appointed the owner of the controversial social media handle Libs of TikTok to his state's library advisory panel. Libs of TikTok reposts videos of people talking about their anti-traditional lifestyles and goals. One post led to the firing of an Oklahoma teacher. Walter says that teacher was a self-avowed anarchist who wanted to turn students against their parents. I spoke with the superintendent about the unrest in his state schools. All right, Ryan Walters, superintendent of schools in Oklahoma. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to start by talking about all the fire you're coming under recently for your actions in, in the school district in Oklahoma, including your appointment of Libs of TikTok founder Kaya Rachik. Tell us about all this. You know, it is fascinating. You have the left that is pushing this unbelievably radical agenda on our kids, this left wing agenda that's trying to indoctrinate our kids, sexualize our kids. Uh, turn them into Marxists, right? And when you have states like ours where we're going to absolutely bring transparency to schools, we're going to actually hold administrators accountable for pushing a woke ideology instead of academics on kids. So we bring in Kai Rachik from Libs of TikTok to help us uncover instances of indoctrination in the classroom, um, teachers and administrators that are trying to turn our kids into social justice warriors, and the left loses their mind, the teachers union loses their mind, they attack me, they attack her, but the reality is, is we're bringing transparency to a system that has been indoctrinated, that has been infiltrated by leftists indoctrinating our kids. Parents have demanded transparency, parents have demanded accountability, and that's what we're bringing to our schools. Um, this school district, um, <clears throat> Edmond Public Schools in Oklahoma, had a few, a few different schools that had fundraisers where there's videos of kids licking things like butter and uh, maybe, uh, or, or peanut butter or honey off the feet of, stu of what are presumed to be students, potentially faculty. Uh, in some cases, you see students licking uh, these things out of people's armpits, like a shirtless person. They're licking these substances out of, out of their armpits as part of this fundraiser. What is happening with this? So again, this is a great example of, you know, the left says, hey, you know, we want moms for liberty. We want libs of TikTok. We want parents out of the conversation. They're crazy. They're telling you all this stuff is going on and it's, it's not happening. Oh, it is happening. We saw two of the biggest districts in Oklahoma that were allowing the activities you described, kids licking peanut butter off of other kids as part of their fundraising activities. And instead of coming out and apologizing and saying they'll get to the bottom of it, they've justified it. They said, oh, well, this was part of a school activity for raising money for charity. And, th and they, no apology, no response. Well, we're now investigating those districts, so their tune has changed now. We're starting to get more information on what happened, um, who, what school officials okayed these materials, and we're gonna make sure this doesn't happen again. I wanted to talk about Nex Benedict, mm -hmm. the transgender student in a school in Oklahoma who um, <clears throat> was in a fight in a school bathroom and then uh, died, but it's not 100% clear about h how Benedict died. What do you know about this? Sure, so, you know, first of all, it's just absolute tragedy, Lo losing a student. Um, you know, my prayers and thoughts have been with that family, with the community, with, 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 with their friends. And, and what we've seen is law enforcement has asked to let the investigation play out because they're still interviewing folks and trying to get feedback on what happened and get to the bottom of it. But law enforcement came out and said this fight in the school had nothing to do with the student's death. So they've already ruled that out. They're looking for what the cause of death was. That, that information will be coming out shortly. But what's been terrible is you've seen left-wing groups who have used this child's death to attack conservatives, to attack me, to, to attack our state uh, conservatives in the state for a political means. All right, and I also want to talk about um, Chastin Buttigieg, the husband of Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Um, he says that you failed next, 
that you failed next in this incident and, and that you parrot anti-LGBTQ rhetoric. What's your response to him? So the, uh, you know, you got a, an individual here that the Buttigieg's are on TV, they'll have videos of them having kids pledge allegiance to a pride flag. These are individuals that think that your kids need to be, have sexual orientation, transgenderism, gay and lesbian movements pushed on them. They've written multiple books about it addressed to kids. They're having kids pledge allegiance to a pride flag. These individuals do not share Oklahoma values. We don't want that type of behavior being pushed on our kids. So they absolutely do not, look, I, I, I don't really care what he has to say about what we should be doing in Oklahoma. He doesn't share our values. They are for indoctrinating kids. And so we just completely reject the Buttigieg's judges, uh, judgments over Oklahoma. They don't have a clue about education. They don't have a clue about Oklahoma or American values. So we just completely reject uh, their input on the issue. All right, Ryan Walters, Superintendent of Schools in Oklahoma, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Up ahead, math enthusiasts and bakers are celebrating today, March 14th. Find out what's bringing them together. And the hang loose sign may become officially recognized as Hawaiian heritage. Why the gesture means so much to locals, more shortly here on NTD News Today. Hi, I'm Susan Lucci. You may know me from my many years on television. I never thought about heart disease until I had my own heart event. I felt this slight pressure in my chest, just slight. I thought, oh, it's nothing, it'll go away. I didn't get it. I did not get it. But a few days later, while shopping at a boutique, that pressure returned much stronger. It felt like an elephant pressing on my chest. I had a 90% a blockage in my main artery and a 75% blockage in the adjacent artery. I was rushed into surgery where I received two stents in my arteries. Stents developed through research funded by the American Heart Association. Those stents saved my life. That's why I'm in front of you today, asking you to join me in supporting the American Heart Association by becoming a monthly donor. Call now or go to helpheart.org. For only $19 a month, just 63 cents a day, you can help fund the next medical breakthrough. Get the next person trained in CPR, the next hospital certified in high quality cardiovascular care. I'm so grateful to the American Heart Association. Their research helped save my life. I can enjoy life with my children, my grandchildren, and my friends. Heart disease is America's number one killer. And your support now can help save your life or the life of someone you love. Give $19 a month with your credit card and we'll send you this special t-shirt that you can wear to show that you are helping save lives. Please listen to your heart. The only reason I'm here today is because I did. So please call the number on your screen or go to helpheart.org now. Join me as a monthly donor today and help save even more lives. Thank you. Revolutionary in his field, Dr. Bonatti created, perfected, and patented the Bonatti spine procedures. Using his genius, Bonatti invented the precise tools necessary to minimize surgery, scarring, anesthesia, and recovery. So successful are the Bonatti spine procedures, they consistently reflect 98.75% patient satisfaction. 75,000 procedures have been performed exclusively at our location. Nearly half our patients suffer from failed back and neck surgeries at other facilities. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. Presenting the heritage of traditional Chinese martial arts, fostering martial ethics, and reviving the true tradition. The preliminaries for the 2024 NTD International Traditional Martial Arts Competition will be held across New York, Taiwan, and Germany. The grand finals will be broadcast live online worldwide in August 2024. For more information, please call 1-888-477-9228. Math enthusiasts and bakers are celebrating Pi Day. The celebration lands on March 14th, or 314, the first three digits of the mathematical constant. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more on the festivities. Around the world, people will mark Pi Day with a slice of sweet or savory pie. 
At Michelle's Pies in Norwalk, Connecticut, manager Stephen Jarrett said it's one of their biggest days of the year. It's a mathematical number that people love to turn into something fun and something delicious. Pi is a mathematical constant that expresses the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. In 2009, Congress designated every March 14th as Pi Day in an effort to spur more interest in math and science. I remember growing up in like high school, sometimes like the math teacher would have pie for pie day because it was just something fun to do in class. Michelle's Pies has 41 national pie championship awards. Today, hundreds of pies are going out to companies, schools, and individual customers. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Hawaii's state legislature has introduced a pair of bills that would make a traditional Hawaiian hand gesture official. The gesture is sometimes known outside the islands as hang loose, a sign associated with surf culture. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. Pinky and thumb extended with the remaining fingers curled down. This is Hawaii's shaka. Hawaiians use shakas to convey a range of warm-hearted sentiments from high and by to thanks and aloha. So there's no wrong way to do a shaka. Um, I mean, I, I typically do this, some people do that. I mean, you should see my husband's shaka. It's kind of like a not even shaka. My daughter, who's two and a half, she knows how to shaka now. I'm so proud of that. Now a pair of bills in the state legislature would make the shaka the state's official gesture and recognize Hawaii as its birthplace. State Senator Glenn Wakai introduced the Senate version. We need to take ownership of this in case someone else in another state or another country wants to somehow claim all the goodness that is embodied in this hand gesture. So we are on our way, introduce the bill. We're at the halfway point of the legislative session. It's still alive. Wakai expects the bill to pass. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And if you have any news tips or feedback for our show, please feel free to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And be sure to stick around for NTD Newsroom at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll cover more stories from the U.S. and around the world. There are real consequences to controlled media. And NTD's founders know them firsthand. Our freedom of thought is the price. This is the lesson that guides us in everything we do. Yeah, so there's the tear gas there. We know the value of a free society. And we take seriously the responsibility to preserve it. We are NTD. What do you do when your tire goes flat and there's no air anywhere? You reach for Bullseye Pro. The smarter, faster, hands-free way to fill it up with air. Bullseye Pro is equipped with a rechargeable lithium-ion power plant. So fast and so convenient. It's like the power of an air compressor in the palm of your hand. Look, you can inflate all four tires on a single charge. It has a built-in smart pressure digital sensor that gauges and automatically stops when the set tire pressure is reached. Easily inflate pull toys, exercise balls, and more. Call or go online now and get the complete Bullseye Pro inflation system for the factory direct price of just $79.99. Plus, we'll ship your entire order free and we'll give you a 50% discount on a second one. Order now. To order, call 1-800-984-7221. That's 1-800-984-7221 or go to GetBullseyePro.com. We are only 80 years removed from countries that killed 60 to 70 million people intentionally. And we have people being like, oh, it can't happen here. Yeah, it can. And it might. These people, they're not interested in the facts. They're not interested in anything except crushing people that are in their way. There needs to be a formal deprogramming of the cult members. A strong church can stop this.
Hillsdale College is reaching and teaching millions of Americans to pursue truth and defend liberty. But to do that in an even bigger way, we need your help. Your generous support helps educate students from kindergarten to college, all while refusing every penny of government funding, even indirect funding like student loans or grants. And your dedicated giving allows us to teach millions of Americans through our free online courses. You make all the difference. Give a gift today. Just use this link. All right, I'm at the house and uh, I'm gonna head inside. Okay, come on, this door. I'm in the house. What do you see? Uh, let me check the den. Uh, there's nothing in the den. Let me check the kitchen. Uh, there's no one downstairs, it looks like. Wait, what was that? I don't know. Let me, let me head upstairs. What do you see? What the? Did you shut this bathroom door? No. What? It's not here. What do you mean? The, the gun's not here. What? Where is it? Oh my god. What's going hey, on? Cam! Oh my god, what's going Cameron? on? Cameron? Are you in there? Open the door! Cam! Please! Please! Open the door, Cameron! Come on, Cam. Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are today's top stories. A group of U.S. investors may buy TikTok. With the app's fate in the Senate uncertain, why former Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin is gathering investors? And former President Trump is in court for his classified documents case. What's happening next with this case? Arlene Richards will have the latest from the courthouse. President Biden in Michigan today to drum up support among key demographics. Has his administration done enough to keep the important swing state blue? We hear from local voters. Florida is preparing for an influx of my immigrants from Haiti. We bring you what steps Governor Ron DeSantis is taking amid the unrest in the Caribbean. American performance artists targeted with hate propaganda from the Chinese Communist Party, wielded by none other than a Chinese-speaking U.S. customs officer, a lawmaker now calling for a thorough investigation. Math enthusiasts and bakers are celebrating today, March 14th. Find out what's bringing them together. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. To begin the show, a TikTok buyout is in the works. Former U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin told CNBC today that he's gathering investors to try to buy the app. Just yesterday, the House of Representatives passed a bill to address the threat posed by the short-term video platform. The legislation would give Chinese owner ByteDance six months to divest from the U.S. branch or face a ban. TikTok is calling the bill a ban and urging senators to listen to their constituents before taking any action. Mnuchin told CNBC's Squawk Box on Thursday, quote, I think the legislation should pass and I think it should be sold. The former Treasury Secretary added it's a great business and it's worth a lot of money. Speaking of TikTok, regulators in Italy are fining the social media platform $11 million. That's for failing to conduct adequate content checks. Italy's antitrust authority said th today that TikTok has not taken adequate measures to prevent the spread of potentially harmful content to young users. The Italian regulator referred to videos showing a popular challenge among users. It involves pinching cheeks to leave a lasting bruise on the cheekbone. TikTok responded to the fine saying, quote, we disagree with this decision. The company said they've been restricting the videos for users under 18. Last month, a separate regulator in Italy forced TikTok to remove the videos. President Biden is campaigning in Michigan today. The Democratic incumbent is looking to shore up support in the key battleground state ahead of November. NTD's Daniel Monahan has more on Biden's trip to Siginaw County, where the president will be looking to energize black and union-affiliated voters. Saginaw County has seen better days. 
Mass layoffs beginning in the late 20th century brought a dramatic decline in the region's population and economy. Local resident Jeffrey Bowles says the area has been hurting for a long time. We look around our community and 10, 20, 30 years go by and the same blight is here. The same joblessness is here. Once a Democratic voter, Bulls said that he's considering voting for none of the above this time around. The Democratic stronghold of Saginaw is encircled by predominantly Republican areas within the larger county. Republican legislator Tim Kelly says Saginaw has a knack for picking winners on the big stage. Saginaw has been kind of pinpoint accurate on presidential uh, elections. Bishop Hurley Coleman says this particular election has been harder to read for lots of people. It's how do I filter through all of this noise and find out what's really happening? That's why, that's why I'm excited about the president making these kinds of trips. The bishop believes the Biden administration has done a lot of good things. President Joe Biden knows that if there is a place in, in America that he can tell his story to a people that need to hear it, Saginaw is that typical place. Winning swing states like Michigan is a must for whoever wants to claim the presidency this year. Current real clear polling averages show former President Trump with an over three point lead in the state. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Senior White House officials today are set to meet with the Arab, Muslim, and Palestinian American community leaders in Chicago. The meeting will give officers a chance to directly hear concerns over the Israel-Hamas war in Gaza. The meeting is a part of the administration's ongoing efforts to reach Arab and Muslim communities, although the Chicago Sun-Times reports that some community leaders are declining the meeting today. The gathering also comes on the same day President Biden is traveling back to Michigan to campaign. Last month, the Democratic primary in the state showed more than 100,000 uncommitted votes partly fueled by the handling of the war. And in other election news, yesterday we reported that Judge McAfee dis dismissed six of the charges against former President Trump in the Georgia election case against him. The case itself still stands, though, and this latest development comes as somewhat of a surprise. To speak with us about this and offer his analysis is Paul Kaminar, lead counsel at the National Legal and Policy Center. Paul, great to see you again. To begin with, could you briefly explain the judge's reasoning here? Yeah, this was uh, clearly warranted. What the judge basically said was that these six counts in the indictment that charged uh, Donald Trump, Giuliani, and a couple others of uh, interfering with the state election procedures, uh, they said in the indictment that you made them violate their oath of office. Well, their oath of office is to defend the Constitution of Georgia and the Constitution of the United States. So the question is, which of the hundred provisions in those constitutions did they take an oath to uphold that Trump allegedly caused them to violate? This was a rookie mistake by this uh, prosecutor, Nathan Wade, who we know is a lover, former lover of uh, Fonnie Willis. Uh, and, and so this is not surprising, but the judge did the right mm -hmm. thing because okay. there was no specificity in the indictment on these charges as to what exactly they were alleging is the crime here. And we are expecting to hear more news about the Fonnie Willis, Nathan Wade aspect of this case. And so I want to get to that in a little while. But how, first up, how do you think this decision of the judge uh, yesterday will impact the case itself? What's the importance well, of it? Well, it, it, uh, it erases six of the uh, counts. I think it's uh, a blow to the indictment. Uh, the other counts still stand, and so uh, it depends upon what the uh, prosecutor does with this decision. And they have a couple options. They could uh, appeal it to a higher court, or they can go back to the grand jury and get a superseding indictment to fill in the gaps, or they could just simply drop these charges and, and go forward with the other charges. But keep in mind, uh, this is the charge that they claim Trump in that infamous call uh, to Raffensperger, the secretary of state for the elections, asked him to that he wanted to find 11,780 votes. Keep in mind that he didn't ask him to violate any law to do that. He just wanted him to go back and double check. And it's that count that's being 
thrown out here. So that, I think, uh, does a big blow to their case if they don't uh, fix a, uh, in every, in an amended complaint, uh, indictment, or appeal it. Right. So the judge, for, in his reasoning, was saying, as you, you mentioned, that there wasn't enough detail in these, this aspect of these allegations. So if they just provided right. more detail, um, potentially it could just come back on the table and be part of the case again. How do you think this to and froing and all these minor aspects coming into the spotlight could Im influence public opinion about this case amid the other well, hearings regarding the case as well? Yeah, I, I think this is uh, this case is uh, pretty much uh, damaged goods as it is with all the uh, flaws that we've seen, and not only this dismissal of these counts, but the whole episode of uh, disqualifying Bonnie Willis and, and Nathan Wade. And I think the public is uh, uh, saying, uh, if they haven't already, that this is basically a, a witch hunt uh, going after Donald Trump. And in any event, I can't see this case being tried before the election anyway with all these procedural uh, roadblocks in the way. Right. And just lastly, Paul, we are expecting to possibly hear from uh, McAfee today about the hearing of around misconduct regarding uh, potential misconduct regarding Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade, which you alluded to earlier. Uh, what do you think is what are you expecting and what could be the significance of that? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, we'll hear either today or by tomorrow, as the judge said, he would try to get this decision out. Uh, I think he's going to uh, maybe uh, split the baby, so to speak, uh, because it depends upon whether there was an actual conflict of interest, which is uh, what they say the standard is, is the, the prosecutor, or an apparent conflict of interest, which Trump attorneys uh, argued. And I think it's clear there's at least an apparent conflict of interest. So the judge may say, well, there is uh, at least an apparent conflict of interest, and he may uh, throw uh, uh, Fannie Willis off the case or uh, uh, Nathan Wade, the uh, special counsel prosecutor, or he may throw the whole team off. But she's facing some other major problems because she testified that this relationship began after she appointed Nathan Wade to be special prosecutor, whereas there was testimony under oath that said, no, no, they had this relationship before uh, uh, he, she hired him. So uh, regardless of what this judge does, she could be facing some criminal complaints on her mm -hmm. own for perjury. Uh, and so this case is really damaged goods, like I said. Right. And regardless of what the judge rules, I, I think uh, this case is going to be uh, not tried before the election. And of course, Fannie Willis being the Fulton County District Attorney leading the case against former President Trump in Georgia there. Thank you so much. Paul Kaminar, lead counsel at the National Legal and Policy Center. I really appreciate it. And the Republican National Committee is suing Michigan's Secretary of State in an effort to trim the state's voter rolls. The lawsuit filed yesterday claims that Michigan is failing to maintain accurate rolls. The lawsuit claims that at least 53 counties in Michigan have more active registered voters than they have citizens over the age of 18. Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson hit back. She told NBC News that of officials have done more in the last five years than in the previous two decades to remove deceased voters and ineligible citizens from the rolls. She called the lawsuit a PR campaign and accused the RNC of abusing the legal process. Former North Carolina Governor Pat McCrory is stepping down from his role as the national co-chair of a group called No Labels. This happened shortly after members of the third party presidential movement decided to continue with their plan for a presidential ticket. No Labels hasn't announced a presidential ticket yet, but an official with the movement says they want to find candidates as soon as possible. No Labels believes many voters might consider voting for an independent candidate. This because they're not happy with a potential rematch between President Biden and former President Trump. But some groups criticize no labels, thinking they could spoil the 2024 election by splitting votes. The group says this argument is meant to scare people and limit their choices. Coming up, another Boeing plane has mid-flight troubles. That marks at least the sixth time over the past week. More on the American Airlines flight that was forced to make an emergency landing after this break. And New York City is losing residents. We have more on the latest census estimates and what they tell us about trends in population. More in just a moment here on NTD News Today.
They're just kids, hungry, homeless, and vulnerable. Abused kids often feel safer on the street. Now, more than ever, that's the most dangerous place of all. Covenant House is rescuing and protecting kids during this COVID-19 crisis. We're providing safe shelter to thousands, but the need is overwhelming, and no child is ever turned away. Please call or go online now with your gift of $19 a month to help a homeless child. You'll provide safe shelter, hot meals, and medical care. Your gift will show our kids they're loved. Homeless kids are afraid and alone with nowhere else to turn. You want to know that there's somewhere you can go that's safe. So the Covenant House did that for us. Please call now. With your gift of $19 a month, we'll send you this soft, comforting blanket to show you're helping our kids. Please don't wait. In our national crisis, your gift is the lifeline a child needs. Please call or go online to safeplacetosleep.org now. Thank you for saving precious lives. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and I'm here to tell you about my new product from my pillow towels that actually work. Watch this absorbency test. Here's another towel that we randomly went out and bought. Here's one of my towels with a nice design. I don't know if you can see this, but you could line a swimming pool with this. I mean, this is crazy. Get rid of it. Towels that actually work. What a concept. I'm interrupting this commercial to let you know you can get our six-piece My Towels, regular $69.98, now only $29.98. Or you can save 25% on our brand new kitchen towels made with the same technology as our famous My Towels. Also, we have bath sheets, bath towels, washcloths, hand towels, and so much more. And the best part, with your promo code, your entire order ships absolutely free. So go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use that promo code to get deep discounts on all my towels. And for a limited time, your order ships absolutely free. Hi, I'm Kelly Wright. We thank you for joining us and watching America's Hope here on NTD News. Bottom line is, I know you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, but let's give you some good news in the midst of the bad news. Watch us nightly right here on NTD News for a full dose of America's hope. An influx of immigrants from Haiti might be coming to the U.S. Officials are now improving safety measures as more people might try to flee civil unrest in the Caribbean island. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says he's dedicating significant resources to combat illegal vessels coming to his state. DeSantis said he is sending over 250 officers and soldiers and over a dozen air and sea craft to the southern coast of Florida. Those resources are coming from the Division of Emergency Management, the State Guard, and the police. Roughly half the people in Haiti are now under the control of heavily armed gangs. The International Rescue Commission says that number goes up to 80 percent in the country's capital city. The ongoing violence also prompted the United States to deploy an elite team of Marines to protect the American Embassy. Earlier this week, the Pentagon announced it would be doubling its funding for a multinational security support mission in Haiti. And another Boeing jet encountered troubles yesterday. That marks at least the sixth incident in the past week. An American Airlines flight made an emergency landing at the LAX airport after the pilot reported a possible mechanical issue. American Airlines said this morning that the issue was low pressure in one of the airplane's tires. The 23-year-old Boeing 777 plane took off from Dallas, Texas and landed in Los Angeles without any incident. American Airlines said the aircraft taxied to the gate under its own power and customers got off the plane normally. Boeing overwrote security camera footage showing work being done on the door plug that blew out on an Alaska airline flight. That's according to a letter yesterday from National Transportation Safety Board Chair Jennifer Homendy to U.S. Senators. Here are the details. The question of who exactly worked on that component of the plane when it was repaired last year has kept federal officials puzzled amid growing scrutiny of work practices at one of the world's biggest plane makers. 
Homendy said, quote, the absence of those records will complicate the NTSB's investigation moving forward. Last week in a Senate committee hearing, Homendy had said she spoke to Boeing CEO David Calhoun and asked for the names of those who performed repairs on the door. Calhoun said he was unable to provide that information. She said he told her Boeing has no records of the work being performed. A Boeing official told Reuters on condition of anonymity, the standard practice at Boeing is to overwrite security videos after 30 days, but declined to answer additional questions. The NTSB said last month four key bolts were missing from the door plug that blew out on the plane. It turns out the documents detailing the door plug removal that were required by Boeing's practices were never created, according to a Boeing letter to a senator on Friday. The Federal Aviation Administration has grounded the MAX 9 for several weeks after an audit found production issues with the jet. The Justice Department also opened a criminal investigation into the mid-air emergency in January. And Vice President Kamala Harris plans to tour a Minnesota abortion clinic today. This as Democrats play up their opposition to the rollback of abortion access in their effort to re-elect President Biden in November. It will be the first time that a president or vice president has been to an abortion clinic, according to Harris's office. Her trip to the Minneapolis-St. Paul area is part of a nationwide tour she began in January. Harris aims to draw attention to the fallout after the U.S. Supreme Court in 2022 overturned Roe v. Wade. The decision cleared the way for Republican-led states to enact limitations or bans on abortion. Abortion access has proven to be a potent issue driving voters to the polls and could be pivotal in the presidential race and congressional elections this year. Making it harder to oust the Speaker of the House. Current Speaker Mike Johnson says the House might change the rules, making it more difficult to remove somebody from the post. Johnson made the comments during a press conference yesterday. He says the motion to vacate the Speaker is an issue that comes up a lot and that the House might change the rules next Congress. But Johnson stressed that he's not the one advocating for these changes, saying he doesn't think it's a big issue right now. Under the current rules, it only takes one representative to bring forward a motion to vote out the Speaker. Former Speaker Kevin McCarthy had agreed to that. During Nancy Pelosi's days as Speaker, it would take a majority of either party. Does an extra day off a week sound good? Senator Bernie Sanders thinks so. The independent senator introduced a bill yesterday to establish a four-day work week with no cut in pay. Sanders says American workers are over 400 percent more productive than they were in the 1940s, but that millions are working longer hours for lower wages than they were decades ago. Under the 32-hour Workweek Act, overtime pay would start after 32 hours and would be calculated at a rate of 1.5 times a person's salary for workdays longer than 8 hours. And workers would get twice their regular pay for workdays longer than 12 hours. Former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani may be forced to sell his homes in New York and Florida. That's to raise cash for a massive decimation, defamation judgment against him as he works his way through bankruptcy proceedings. Bloomberg reports Giuliani's attorneys say that several of his properties may be put up for sale to raise cash to pay off his debt. Giuliani filed for bankruptcy protection in December, a day after being ordered to pay $148 million to, for, to two former Georgia election workers. Giuliani's total debt is now at almost $153 million. Yesterday, attorneys said that a draft listing agreement for his New York condo is being finalized. That's according to the Bloomberg report. It also says a committee representing Giuliani's unsecured creditors is working on putting his Palm Beach property up for sale. And New York City, where Giuliani was once mayor, is seeing population decline. This is according to the latest census estimates released today. The data shows that roughly 78,000 residents left New York City in 2023. The city's population is now at 8.26 million. Out of the five boroughs, only Manhattan saw population growth. The Bronx shrank the most. Population decline has continued in the Big Apple since the pandemic. From mid-2020 to mid-2023, roughly 550,000 residents moved out of the city. That's 6% of its population. But the population decline last year wasn't as big as the year before. City officials say the latest data underestimates the recent influx of illegal immigrants. Since early 2022, the city has taken in 180,000 180, of them. 
U.S. Marshals are now offering up to a $5,000 reward for the arrest of 17-year-old Asir Boone. Authorities issued a warrant for attempted murder on him yesterday. They say he was among a group of four suspects involved in last week's shooting at a Philadelphia transit bus stop that injured eight high school students. Three other teen suspects have already been arrested and are being held for the incident. Officials have contacted Boone's family and urged them to turn him in. So far, he's still in the loose. And in Kansas City, Missouri, three men are facing federal charges in connection to the Super Bowl parade shooting on February 14th. Federal prosecutors are pressing firearms charges against three men. That's according to a federal criminal complaint unsealed yesterday. 22-year-old Fido Manning faces 12 counts. 21-year-old Ronell Williams Jr. and 19-year-old Shailene Groves each face four counts. Prosecutors are not accusing the three men of opening fire, but they say the three men were involved in illegal firearms trafficking and made straw purchases of firearms. Authorities say some of the firearms recovered at the shooting were illegally purchased or trafficked. Two other people who are juveniles had been arrested and charged over the shooting. Coming up, former President Trump in court for his classified documents case. Our Arlene Richards is standing by outside the Florida courthouse with the latest. And hearts broken, families ripped apart. A film screening held at Harvard University shines a light on massive crime still happening in today's China. We'll have the details soon when we return. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, ride your bike. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, smile big and bright. Thousands of your kids just like me are happy every day. And it's all because of generous people like you who support Shriners Hospitals for Children every month. All you have to do is call the number on your screen or go online to loveshriners.org right now with your monthly gift. Because of people like you, Shriners Hospitals for Children is able to make an everyday miracle happen for kids like me. If you're happy and you know it, dance around. If you're happy and you know it, play a song. Surely show it if you're happy and you know it, take a shot. And when you call or go online right now to donate $19 a month or more, we'll send you this adorable Love to the Rescue blanket as a thank you and a reminder of all the smiles you're bringing to kids' faces every day. Will today be the day you send your love to the rescue? When you call the number on your screen right now and give as little as $19 a month, just 63 cents a day, you'll be making a life-changing difference for a child, just like Sarah. Your monthly gift today could change your life forever. Because of you. We are happy and we know it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please call or go online right now to give. If operators are busy, please wait patiently or go to loveshriners.org right away. The biggest investigation in FBI history. There are more than 1,100 arrests. I sacrificed my dream job to share this information with the American people. Those involved must be held accountable. He's an innocent man. It's going to change narratives no matter what your political perspective is. Did you know the government can essentially rob you in plain sight? Former Fed Chair Alan Greenspan warned, deficit spending is simply a scheme for the confiscation of wealth. But he added, gold stands in the way of this insidious process. Birch Gold Group has helped thousands of Americans diversify their IRA or 401k into gold. To get a free info kit from Birch Gold, text PREPARE to 989898. Again, text PREPARE to 989898 right now. We're in the nation's capital asking the important questions so that you're in the know. 
Join us daily, Monday through Friday, on the Capitol Report on NTD News. Welcome back. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen now says she regrets claims she made in 2021 that inflation is just transitory. This, as new numbers show inflation is higher than expected. Here's Yellen's response to a Fox News anchor yesterday. I regret saying it was transitory. Um, it has come down, but I think transitory means uh, a few weeks or months to most, most people. Yellen made the same made the statement a day after the latest inflation data came in higher than expected. The consumer price index was at 3.2 percent in February. That's above census estimates and up from 3.1 percent in January. The latest data brings the cumulative inflation since President Biden took office to roughly 19 percent. It's not the first time Yellen expressed regret for calling inflation transitory. She made similar statements in January. The House Republican Conference is gathering in West Virginia for their annual policy retreat. Our Washington correspondent Louise Martinez was at the Greenbrier Resort where the event is taking place to bring us this report. We are here in West Virginia, in White Sulphur Springs, at the Greenbrier Historic Resort. It's a historic resort because it was built in 1913, over 100 years ago. But it's also historic because in 1962, the government built a fallout shelter for Congress to relocate in case of a nuclear war. So the House GOP conference is meeting here for three days, starting yesterday, Thursday, uh, throughout Friday. Uh, the conference, the congressmen will gather to strategize about about their policy concerns. Speaker Johnson last night announced that they would be discussing Bidenomics. They would be discussing the failed foreign policy of President Biden, but also strategies for the impeachment inquiry against President Biden. And also, of course, speaking and discussing the strategy for the appropriation bills debate that is coming up for next week. Let's remember that a week from Friday, Congress has to approve the second set of six appropriation bills in order to fund government through fiscal year 2024. So it will be interesting to see uh, what will happen in the next two days. Uh, we already know something that is particularly notable, which is that less than 100 congressmen have uh, shown up for this GOP retreat, which is a big blow for Speaker Johnson and uh, his leadership. Back to you. In the classified documents case, former President Trump and co-defendant Walt Nauta are attending a hearing today in a Florida district court. Their attorneys argue two motions to dismiss the indictment against them. They are accused of conspiring to conceal classified documents and obstructing justice. We're joined now by our legal correspondent Arlene Richards, who's outside the courthouse in Fort Pierce, Florida. Arlene, tell us what's going on in the courtroom so far. Well, good afternoon, Steph. As you can see behind me, there are several supporters here for Donald Trump. He uh, arrived today around 9.30 a.m. As I left the courtroom this afternoon, they were finishing up their arguments on the first motion to dismiss, which is a motion to dismiss based on the fact that the indictment is vague. Now, Trump's position on that is that he was the president in the White House when he ordered that those boxes of documents be transported from the White House to Florida, and that as president, he had the authority to designate them as his personal property. Now, on the other side, they're arguing that most of the, the occurrences that happened here, or all of the occurrences that happened here in this case, happened after he left office. And they're saying that he should be treated as any other individual who tries to uh, obstruct justice. They say that his argument that he is uh, presidential and that he has immunity is it has no merit. Now, when I go back into the courtroom, they're going to argue the second motion, which is a motion to dismiss because of the Presidential Records Act. And so, Arlene, how do you think the judge is leaning so far? Well, it's hard to tell how she's leaning, but she is asking both sides a number of questions, and they are very particular and specific, the questions that she's asking. I think she's trying to pin them down on what the statute means and how it's being applied in this case. And she's asking questions about whether or not the personal records were actually 
deemed personal by President Trump and whether or not it's a little premature for President Trump to now come in and try to dismiss the case when that hasn't been determined by the prosecution as to the records themselves. And she's also concerned about when his clearance ended. When was he no longer able to keep the records that it became unlawful? And she's asking those questions on both sides. So we'll have to see uh, at the end of this uh, when she makes her ruling, how she's going to go with this. She did kind of mention that if she doesn't deny this, you know, how should she go forward? She did ask that question. So I'm not sure she's leaning either way yet, but she is thinking about what she should do if she has to deny these motions. Mm -hmm. Steph? All right. Thank you so much, Arlene. No, we know you keep us updated on this. Arlene Richards, legal correspondent. Cheers. A U.S. customs officer targeting an American performing arts company with Chinese propaganda. The incident now leading to calls for a thorough investigation of possible infiltration into the U.S. government. NTD's Iris Tao has more from Chicago. Two days ago at the O'Hare International Airport, performers of the U.S.-based Qingyun Performing Arts were coming back from a successful performance tour in Europe. But when they were going through the customs, an officer with a Chinese accent targeted the performers with the same hate propaganda that a Chinese Communist Party would use to target religious believers. It just sounded like he was trying to put words into my mouth, like, are you being sponsored by Falun Gong? And it just, so I just said, I don't think I have to answer that question because we escaped from China. But this feels like as if we were being talked to by Chinese government. This is the U.S., like, I'm coming home. And this is something that should never happen in the U.S. Many of Shenyun performers practice Falun Gong, a spiritual discipline severely persecuted in communist China. And the officer allegedly also told other officers that Shenyun dancers were illegal because of their faith. That questioning came despite all of the performers holding either U.S. citizenship or legal visas. In a statement, a CBP spokesperson says CBP strictly prohibits profiling on the basis of race or religion and that CBP does not tolerate actions that are inconsistent with our core values. And Congressman Ryan Babin, meanwhile, calling for a thorough investigation, saying in a statement that we should never allow the PRC, one of the most repressive countries on the planet, to have influence over our federal government. An immigration lawyer told NTD that the U.S. government needs to strengthen background checks of its officers. Because you can imagine lots of examples where the government of China would, would do well for itself to plant people within the U.S. government, asylum officers, U.S. CIS officers, uh, any position within the government. The Falun Gong is one group that certainly has been targeted over the years within the United States, and, and it's important for the U.S. government to be aware about that and to try to uh, actively prevent such uh, threats. Just last year, the FBI arrested two suspected Chinese agents and charged them with attempting to bribe a public official in the scheme targeting Falun Gong in the United States. Reporting in Chicago, Illinois, Aris Tao, NTD News. At a film screening at Harvard, shining a spotlight on a brutal crime happening in today's China. Called State Organs, the award-winning documentary zooms in on China's forced organ harvesting the practice of harvesting organs from victims while they're still alive. My sister loved singing and danced well. My sister was kidnapped by police. My brother and many practitioners benefited from the practice that made them healthier and better people. He said that he would contact me again, but I never received any call from him. The screening was held by three student organizations at Harvard. One attendee said more people need to watch the film because it touches on the issue of humanity. I think this really has to be stopped. It's a genocide. This is not just a, a, a one single occasion. Maybe the film showed a specific families that been persecuted, but it's the personal story that tells about a, a larger population. 
the film's producer, Cindy Song, said learning about the victims and their stories kept her up at night and drove her to kickstart the project. It's like a haunting scar on humanity's conscience. We, can, we must let their suffering, their voice be heard by this world. She said despite the family's suffering, there's still hope for the future. The film is available in select theaters across the U.S. or to stream online at GenjingWorld.com. A rare joint mission between Taiwan and China. Both sides sent rescue teams today after a Chinese fishing vessel capsized near a Taiwanese island. Taiwan sent its Coast Guard at China's request. There were a total of six people in distress. And at present, with the joint efforts of the search and rescue units of the two sides and the garrison of Dongding Island, four people have been rescued, of which two are alive and two have no signs of life. The rescue mission comes after China normalized drills around Taiwan. It began regular patrols around Kinmen, a Taiwanese island six miles off China's coast. That after two Chinese nationals died while trying to flee from Taiwan's Coast Guard after entering prohibited waters, China said they're fishermen. The Chinese Communist Party sees Taiwan as part of China and vowed to take it under control by force, despite never having ruled the island. And new numbers are in. Officials say seven were killed and 27 others injured in the deadly blast in northern China yesterday. The explosion site is one hour from the capital city, Beijing. Taking into account the regime's history of covering up disaster casualties, the true death toll remains unclear. The explosion took place at around 8 a.m. yesterday, followed by another explosion an hour later. A giant fireball exploded from a shop selling fried chicken, blowing debris out into the street. The moment was caught on dash cam video by a car driving nearby. The blast left the building in ruins. It also shattered the glass on the lower floors of the building across the street. Officials say a suspected gas leak tr triggered the incident, and an investigation is now underway. And a city in Japan is on high alert for a cat that fell into a vat of hazardous chemicals before disappearing into the night. Security camera footage from, factories, from a factory shows the cat making its way through the building before leaving. A trail of paw prints was discovered by a worker on Monday, leading to a nine-foot deep tank of hexylevent chromium. The material is a cancer-causing chemical that can induce rashes and inflammation if touched or inhaled, according to officials. We hope that. Coming up, the hang loose sign may become officially recognized as Hawaiian heritage. Why the gesture means so much to locals. And the most powerful rocket to ever reach orbital speeds, SpaceX launches its third test flight with no explosions this time. More on the mission shortly here on NTD News Today. watching this I didn't make it thanks to people like you and the American Heart Association my family never had to see this video I was a healthy 47 year old no symptoms but then my doctor discovered I had a bad heart valve that was beyond repair the scariest day of my life was when I was sitting on a gurney as I looked at my wife was at my side and my kids had me surrounded. Deep down, you know, this could be it. This could be all there is. Not having him around for Riley to grow up with and have that papa figure in his life, that would have been hard. This little heart valve did something really big. It saved my life. I wouldn't be here today without it. The research for this heart valve was funded by the American Heart Association. And that's why I'm asking you to become a monthly donor for just $19 a month. When you do, you'll help fund the next medical breakthrough that could save your life or the life of someone you love. You'll also provide life-saving CPR training and help certify hospitals to give the best care to those who have had a heart attack or stroke. When you give $19 a month, we'll send you a t-shirt just like this one. From the moment you put it on, you'll help raise awareness for heart disease and stroke. Since my surgery, I had a son get married. 
I had a daughter graduate high school. I had another daughter give birth to a precious boy. I would have missed all that. And that's why it's personal for me. We're very thankful for everyone who is a donor because it gives us more time. Every 40 seconds, someone has a heart attack. The next person you help save could be someone you love or even you. Become a monthly donor today by calling or going to helpheart.org because it's personal. Did you know indoor air quality can be five to even 100 times worse than outdoors? Meet the Air Doctor. It's your answer for clean air and the only hospital grade air purifier equipped with advanced ultra HEPA filters proven to improve your indoor air quality and overall health. Air Doctor circulates and triple filters the air in your room up to five times per hour. Say goodbye to pollen, smoke, mold spores, pet dander, even viruses, because the Ultra HEPA filter removes virtually 100% of dangerous contaminants down to 0.003 microns. That's 100 times smaller filtration than ordinary HEPA purifiers. This would have been in your lungs. Finally, get relief from allergies and asthma and reduce airborne disease. It's pulling the pollutants out. It's even pulling the toxic chemicals that our cleaning products leave behind. Call or go to tryairdoctor.com now. Get 40% off our best-selling air purifier. Call 1-800-791-3554. Call now. For the day's top headlines and the news you need to know, tune in right here to NTD Evening News. Welcome back. Recalled cashews sold at Walmart could cause life-threatening reactions in some people. The Food and Drug Administration is recalling eight and a quarter ounce great value honey roasted cashews across the country. That's because some of them contain undeclared coconut and milk products due to incorrect labeling. That could cause serious or life-threatening allergic reactions in some people. The FDA says people can discard the cashews or return them to Walmart for a full refund. Math enthusiasts and bakers are celebrating Pi Day. The celebration lands on March 14th, or 314, the first three digits of the mathematical constant. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more on the festivities. Around the world, people will mark Pi Day with a slice of sweet or savory pie. At Michelle's Pies in Norwalk, Connecticut, manager Stephen Jarrett said it's one of their biggest days of the year. It's a mathematical number that people love to turn into something fun and something delicious. Pi is a mathematical constant that expresses the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. In 2009, Congress designated every March 14th as Pi Day in an effort to spur more interest in math and science. I remember growing up in like high school, sometimes like the math teacher would have pie for pie day because it was just something fun to do in class. Michelle's Pies has 41 national pie championship awards. Today, hundreds of pies are going out to companies, schools, and individual customers. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Hawaii's state legislature has introduced a pair of bills that would make a traditional Hawaiian hand gesture official. The gesture is sometimes known outside the islands as hang loose, a sign associated with surf culture. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. Pinky and thumb extended with the remaining fingers curled down. This is Hawaii's shaka. Hawaiians use shakas to convey a range of warm-hearted sentiments from high and by to thanks and aloha. So there's no wrong way to do a shaka. Um, I mean, I, I typically do this. Some people do that. I mean, you should see my husband's shaka. It's kind of like a not even shaka. My daughter, who's two and a half, she knows how to shaka now. I'm so proud of that. Now a pair of bills in the state legislature would make the shaka the state's official gesture and recognize Hawaii as its birthplace. State Senator Glenn Wakai introduced the Senate version. We need to take ownership of this in case someone else in another state or another country wants to somehow claim all the goodness that is embodied in this hand gesture. So we are on our way, introduce the bill. We're at the halfway point of the legislative session. It's still alive. Wakai expects the bill to pass. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. An island salt patch is one of the last remaining in all of Hawaii. 22 native families come together to make traditional Hawaiian salt NTD has more on the indigenous practice. Before walking to the Hanapepe salt patch, Kanani Santos removes his footwear. 
Then he stands quietly for a few moments. As I walk in here before I enter this place, I like stopping right before that trail to take off my shoes to get myself ready to enter something like this. So I take a deep breath and take it all in and I say a little prayer to myself. But over the past decade, development has threatened the salt patch on the island of Kauai. Pollution from nearby aircraft, sand erosion from vehicles, and litter add to the problem. Other salt-making families are searching for solutions to save their patch. One strategy is to block vehicles from driving onto the beach. We want to continue to share the space with everyone. So that's why we were like, okay, no, let's just block so that all the boulders are here, keep the cars here. And over time, we've definitely seen this berm naturally restore itself. The salt is always given away, never sold, an important part of this cultural and spiritual practice. I was always taught to give it away. Um, and when my dad told me it's our responsibility to give it away, those were such powerful words in my soul. Santos believes they're making their elders proud by so keeping this traditional practice alive, and he hopes to pass it on to future generations. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And looking further abroad and afar, SpaceX successfully launched a third test flight of its new rocket called Starship. The first two flight tests ended in explosions. The rocket is now the most powerful to reach orbital speeds. This deep space rocket system made it through a 45-minute long integrated flight test. It completed most of its experimental objectives, including opening the payload door. One of the biggest achievements is reaching orbital speeds. The rocket traveled nearly halfway around the globe today, but lost communication on re-entry. The future of this rocket is critical both to SpaceX and its key partner, NASA, which hopes to eventually use it to carry astronauts to the moon's surface. And that's all for today's news. Thank you for tuning in. Feel free to reach out to us with news tips or feedback at news.today at ntd.com. And be sure to stick around for NTD Newsroom at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll cover more stories from the U.S. and around the world. What's happened to this world we're living in? Why? For the four years he has been on this earth, he has known nothing but...